Okay, let's look at meiosis. Meiosis is the sexual life cycle. So this is, this is how gametes are made for reproduction. Um, this is how eggs are made by females and how sperm are made by males for reproduction. Now on this slide it says there are two divisions but only one duplication of the chromosomes. And that's true. There are, well, there are two divisions. Meiosis one is the first division and then the resultant cells, the daughter cells of meiosis one, undergo a second cell division called meiosis two. Now, if you look at the definition, it says meiosis one reduces the chromosome number to produce two haploid daughter cells. So the cell that starts out is diploid. And after meiosis one, the daughter cells are both haploid. Meiosis two copies the haploid daughter cells, both of them, that were the result of meiosis one, to produce four haploid gametes. Now in males, that would be four sperm, four haploid sperm. In females, that's four haploid cells. And we'll see that three of them are called polar bodies. They're very small and they will die. And one is called the ovum or the oocyte. And that's the one that gets ovulated. <clears throat> so let's look at not this slide. How did I get that far ahead? Hmm. Let's look at this slide. This first slide is asexual reproduction here. Asexual, A means without. So there's no gender. Um, no gender on the sex. There's no sex uh, between the uh, uh, species. They're all the same asexual organism. This would be like uh, bacteria typically don't you don't have you know, male and female parts or anything like that. You have some things called pili that you'll get in micro. But for the most part, they're asexual. Uh, protozoans, a lot of protozoans are asexual. They just divide and the two new cells swim off. And then when it gets time, those two divide and the two cells swim off. So there's no gender, no male and female component in asexual uh, organisms. Now, sexual reproduction this involves two partners, one that is female, one that is male. The female produces eggs, the male produces a form of a sperm or a pollen that will get fertilized, that will use, be used to fertilize the egg. And fertilization, we're gonna talk about in just a minute. Somatic cells, you already know that soma means body, so these are body cells. These are all gonna be diploid, the two end number the full chromosome number for somatic cells. Somatic cells undergo mitosis. <clears throat> now gametes, <clears throat> gametes on the other hand, these are haploid cells. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, these, are what, what, these are the cells that are gonna be produced in this chapter. So meiosis is going to reduce the chromosome number and produce four haploid cells. Now fertilization is the restoring of the diploid number. <clears throat> fertilization occurs when a, a sperm or a pollen uh, fertilizes an egg. That means that the two nuclei are going to be fused. So when a sperm fertilizes an egg, that's called fertilization. The two haploid nuclei fuse to form a diploid cell which is called a zygote. <clears throat> we have some terms here. Um, this is a homologous, uh, homologs and sex chromosomes. So let's look, this uh, picture here is not fitting fully on the screen, but let's just look at this. Homologous chromosomes, homo means same, and the, the logos means they, they basically contain the same similarities. They have a lot of similar structures, and they do. They have the same genes for the same traits. So the first 22 pair are called homologous chromosomes. They're, these are all non-sex chromosomes. They do not determine the, the outcome or the gender of the offspring. 
they do have some uh, genes on there that that are for secondary sex traits you know uh, bring out the secondary sex traits of the organism but they do not make you male or female these are also called autosomes of the term it's an older term for them the sex chromosomes these are called allosomes which means other bodies these are the ones that determine your uh, gender whether you're male or female <clears throat> females this is the 23rd pair of chromosomes so females have two X's they got one from mom and one from dad if, they, if you have two X's you're a female males got an X from mom and a Y from dad and that's why they're males they have one X and one Y so the female chromosomes uh, for, for gender two X's are female and for male it's an X and a Y haploid versus diploid okay haploid one set of chromosomes this is the eggs um, and sperm uh, they're both haploid so the n number it means they have one set one set that's 23 chromosomes for humans the diploid set that's die for two employed is sets two sets of chromosomes that's the somatic uh, cells uh, 2n is the diploid number and in humans the 2n number is 46 chromosomes so you got one set from mom and one set from dad 23 chromosomes from mom and 23 chromosomes from dad and they're all homologous chromosomes looking at the human life cycle you can see that the um, it has it shaded across the middle you said that at the first of your life cycle you were a haploid egg and a haploid sperm and when those two haploid nuclei came together look on the right you see fertilization and the cell that has now got a full 2n nucleus is called a zygote it's no longer called an egg it's called a zygote <clears throat> and you can see that it has the diploid number 2n number it undergoes mitosis just regular cell division <clears throat> It makes you know thousands or millions of cells that eventually differentiate into <clears throat> multicellular diploid adults you see that the adults are going to have uh, gonads the female gonad is ovaries the male gonads are testes and those are the organs that make the haploid cells meiosis is undertaken in ovaries and meiosis is undertaken in testes to make their haploid gametes the ovaries have you see through meiosis you see at the top an ovum it's a haploid cell males from the testes through meiosis haploid sperm they have the, the single n there so they're haploid cells most of our life cycle is spent in the diploid state here very few maybe up to three days is spent haploid if that long up to three days but the majority of our life is spent in the diploid form Meiosis in the sexual life cycle. Okay. Um, meiosis here, the definition of meiosis says reduction division and genetic variation in gametes. So, reduction division, um, this, that's about as short as you can make the definition of meiosis because there are two cell division. Meiosis 1 reduces the chromosome number, and meiosis 2 is just cell division just somatic cell division so it copies what those cells are and genetic variation in gametes so we're going to see some new stuff happen in meiosis to give us genetic variation in the gametes that are produced the sexual life cycle here um, animals the dominant stage is diploid remember we have like up to three days you could be in the haploid state um, but most of our life uh, cycle is spent in the uh, uh, diploid state. Okay. Fungi, uh, some, and some algae, I'm sorry, I'm looking at something else. Dominant stage is haploid, and we'll see a little picture of that in just a minute. So, fungi and some algae, their dominant part of their life cycle while they're alive and functioning 
is uh, haploid. And plants can have both multicellular haploid and diploid uh, stages to their life cycles. And we'll see that. Here is the animal life cycle. And you see they've kind of got it wedged and shaded. The gametes, that's a small part of your life cycle. And uh, the diploid multicellular organism is the majority of the life cycle. But you can see the, the gametes there in and in, like egg and sperm. Fertilization occurs. There's your 2N zygote, which undergoes mitosis to produce a diploid multicellular organism. And when they get old enough, they can uh, their, their gonads are going to work to produce uh, gametes, which will be through meiosis, and produce haploid gametes. The fungus and uh, algae, you see that pretty much it's haploid is most of their life cycle. It's not really even half, but uh, haploid multicellular organism. And through mitosis, since they're haploid, they produce haploid gametes, go together in fertilization, produces a zygote where the DNA is mixed, and then through meiosis produces haploid cells that, again, make the multicellular organism. So most of this life cycle of a fungus and an algae is spent haploid. Now here is a um, the plants, and um, this plant is kind of familiar. We just probably haven't seen one part of it, but if you look at this, the line goes straight across. It's like 50-50. So half of this life cycle up here at the top, haploid multicellular organism called a gametophyte, and on the bottom, the diploid multicellular organism is called a sporophyte. Now, you can see that the gametophyte makes gametes, and gametes are pretty much haploid. So there's the haploid cells, one end and one end, and through fertilization, that makes a 2N zygote. Well, that 2N zygote through mitosis makes a diploid multicellular organism, which is called a sporophyte. And the spores are haploid. And so when the spores are released, they make the haploid multicellular organism, the gametophyte. Now, you've seen this before. A fern is the diploid part of this uh, plant's life cycle, to what you've seen before. Diploid multicellular organism, you probably noticed on the underside of the leaf. This is that each one it only has two blades here, two leaf blades. On the underside, you see little black uh, circular packets of something. Those have the spores in there. The one at the top is the gametophyte, and this is not a full picture of a gametophyte. So let's look at the next page. Here you go, the bottom one. See, it looks like a little heart with a beard. The gametophyte uh, it grows at the base of ferns. It's very, very small, quarter inch to smaller, eighth inch, quarter inch. They're pretty small. But this is part of the life cycle of a fern. And these uh, the spores that were released are in the, from the... Uh, from the fern are what produce the gametophytes. And these are haploid. The haploid uh, uh, part of that life cycle. So you look up here at the fern, the mature sporophyte, that's the two end. So uh, the gametophytes are gonna get together, the uh, cells that the gametophyte produces and produces a diploid uh, plant part. This is called the fern. That's, that's that part of that plant's life cycle. I don't do plants too much, but that's the fern is kind of a surprise to me because what we normally see is the mature 2N part of that plant's life cycle. And you can see on the underside there, there's a saurus full of little spores there. Now let's get back to this. Meiosis, two divisions, but only one duplication of chromosomes. And this meiosis one, uh, reduces the chromosome number to produce two haploid daughter cells. And meiosis II copies the haploid daughter cells from meiosis I to produce four haploid gametes. So two division cycles. First, reduction of the chromosome number. And the second is going to be the um, copying of those cells. Now, we have uh, interphase, interphase one. If you see that, it's called interphase one because meiosis one, everything has a one after it. So interphase is where you start, interphase one, and I've written down here what happens. In interphase one, the DNA is duplicated. That's where DNA replication occurs. Remember in the S part of interphase? 
S for synthesis. So that's happening inside of this nucleus. All the DNA is being replicated. Now prophase one, prophase one, you know, um, the chromatin begins to condense into visible chromosomes. That's how you know you've, you're, you're not in interphase anymore because you see some visible bodies there. The chromosomes are coiling up. Uh, nuclear envelope begins to dissolve. Okay, nuclear envelope begins to dissolve. Good. Centrioles move to opposite poles to lay down the spindle apparatus. Okay, that seems like that's normal stuff. That happens normally in prophase. But there's three new things that happen in prophase one of meiosis. The first thing, the pairing of homologous chromosomes is called synapsis. So homologs are going to pair. They're going to line up side by side. There's a crisscrossing of the non-sister chromatids. So the non-sisters are going to lay over each other, and those, those laying over events are called chiasmata, where they lay over each other. And then the exchange of or mixing of gen similar genetic material is called crossing over, where those chiasmata have formed, those pieces of DNA are going to be exchanged between the non-sister chromatids. Non-sister means that uh, it's a male contributions chromosome and the female's contribution, you know, your maternal and your paternal chromosome. When they were replicated, each one consists of two sister chromatids. Well, when the male and the female sisters overlap, those are non-sisters, and that's when the chiasmata are formed and the crossing over of genetic material occurs. That increases genetic variety. Here's an example of the uh, pairing of the homologs. If, if the blue is dad and the red is mom, they've already uh, paired up. They've already uh, had the chiasmata and crossing over has already occurred on this side. So you see that now each one contains portions of the other one, of the other non-sister. You see uh, metaphase one, they're going to be separating. And you follow it all down. We'll follow all this on the next slides. But you see you get four different types of gametes. This is going to be in one gamete. This is going to be in another gamete. This will be the third. This is going to be in the fourth. And they all four are different. One in this case is blue. One is red, blue, red. One is blue, red, blue. And one is all red. So you have four different gametes. So crossing over is where you get your uh, genetic variation. And that occurs in prophase one. So here we go. Uh, I've got this all laid out up here. Um, the chromosomes are starting to condense, nuclear envelopes starting to dissolve, centrioles move into opposite poles to lay down the spindle apparatus, and they're going to be attached to the kinetochores. But what I've shown here is homologs have paired. These are long ones have paired and the short ones have paired. The non-sisters are laying over each other. You can see the chiasmata that are forming. And that's where uh, DNA is going to be exchanged between the two non-sisters. That's called crossing over. And that's where you get the mixing of the DNA between non-sister chromatids. Your, your mom's and dad's DNA is being mixed. Metaphase, another uh, interesting thing, paired homologs, which are called tetrads, Remember, a uh, chromosome of two sisters is called a dyad for two. When the uh, two chromosomes are paired, you have four chromatids there. And that's called a tetrad. Tetra has four. So there's four sisters. So they're still paired, paired homologs, and they're going to move to the metaphase plate, move to the equator of the cell. So the kinetic core microtubules are going to move them to the equator of the cell in metaphase one. Anaphase one, the dyads move to opposite poles. Okay, so the sisters are not separated. They're still making up a chromosome. Each one is, but the homologs are separated. Anaphase one is when the chromosome number is reduced. Because if you look going top, there's one, two chromosomes going north, and one, two chromosomes going south. 
the original cell had four chromosomes. The daughter cells that are going to result from this are only going to have two. You know you're in telophase because of the cleavage furrow, which means that cytokinesis has started. When cytokinesis starts, the cell is in telophase. So it says the formation of a cleavage furrow signals the cell has entered into telophase. That's telophase one. The nuclear envelope begins to reform around the DNA. You can see the little white stuff. That's supposed to be the nuclear envelope reforming. The chromosomes unwind back to the chromatin state, so they're going to unwind. <clears throat> the cleavage furrow would divide the original parent cell into two daughter cells. Each daughter cell will have the same amount of DNA as the original parent, but half the amount of cytoplasm, because the cytoplasm has to be divided between the two new daughter cells. So it's got the same size nucleus because it has the same amount of DNA as the uh, original parent. Is that true or false? That's, no, they got to have the, remember it has the reduced chromosome number. So it's got half the amount of chromosomes in the nucleus. These daughter cells are going to have one half the chromosome number. So in humans, these would have 23 chromosomes each. Remember, meiosis one reduces the chromosome number. The two new daughter cells are in interkinesis. Now, interkinesis, uh, you remember in interphase, you had the DNA is replicating itself. Well, the sisters still haven't been uh, separated. So it's not really an inter interphase. There's no duplication of DNA in interkinesis. In fact, they, that's basically right after they were formed because they're, they're going to go straight into prophase two. The second division, which is going to be meiosis two, will separate sister chromatids. It's gonna, that's when they're going to be separated in meiosis two. The events of the second division, the events of my, uh, meiosis two, are identical to the mitotic phases of meios, mitosis except that the cells are haploid. But, you know, remember mitosis clones what comes into mitosis. So these are haploids, going to make haploid cells, mitosis clones. The daughter cells in telophase two are haploid if the original mother cell before it started was diploid, and that's the way it is. Remember, meiosis one is going to reduce the chromosome number. So, yes. Prophase two, daughter cells move into prophase two. The events of prophase two are identical to the events of, of prophase and mitosis. So both of them are undergoing uh, prophase two. The nuclear envelopes dissolving, chromosomes are coiling up, or chromatins coiling up to form chromosomes, visible units. Centrioles move into opposite poles to lay down the spindle apparatus, which is what it mentions all the rest of this paragraph. Metaphase two, chromosomes line up along the equator of the cell. There they are, lined up along the equator in each of the two daughter cells. Anaphase two, separation of sister chromatids. So it says sister chromatids are pulled apart by the kinetochore microtubules and migrate to opposite poles as chromosomes. So the sisters, sister chromatids are separated in anaphase two and migrate to opposite poles as chromosomes. Telophase two, when you see cytokinesis occurring, see that cleavage furrow, you know you're in telophase two. So the formation of a cleavage furrow in the case to the cell is in telophase two. The result in the production of four haploid daughter cells so it's going to be four haploid daughter cells here that are going to result. And if you look, this will be one, that's two, three, and four, and they have two chromosomes each. The original parent cell that started this whole thing had four. Now these cells have two. I put this up to show you mitosis versus meiosis. Now here's a cell in the middle. And this is just a parent cell. And we're going to show what happens in both of these cases. 
This cell 2n is 4, so this cell has four chromosomes as its diploid number. Let's look at the left-hand side first, mitosis. You know that um, in interphase, the DNA is going to replicate, so each, each chromosome consists of two sisters. And there it is in prophase, you can see that they're all uh, consist of two sisters. In metaphase, all, all the chromosomes line up along the equator. Anaphase, the sisters are separated. And telophase, you know, cytokinesis, and you end up with two daughter cells. And look at them, they're identical, two in, just like the parent. So mitosis copies the cells. Whatever goes into mitosis, it's going to have the same number of chromosomes in the daughter cells. Well, let's see if this cell undertook meiosis. In meiosis, you know that the DNA is, is uh, replicated, and you know that the homologous pairs, homologous chromosomes pair, and that's called synapsis. So they're paired, they're side by side. You know that there are uh, chiasmatiform and crossing over occurs to mix the DNA. In metaphase, the paired homologs line up along the equator. In anaphase one, hom homologs are separated, not sisters. The homologs are separated. So one long, big one, long one goes left, one long one goes right. One short one goes left, one short one goes right. And they each are still consisting of two sister chromatids. When you undertake meiosis two, which is just mitosis, the um, Chromosomes are going to line up along the equator, and the sisters are going to be separated in an anaphase, and you end up with four haploid uh, cells at the end of meiosis two. So this is just comparing what happens to a given cell if it undertook mitosis versus if it undertook meiosis. Mitosis is just copying the cell, making a clone of the cell. Two n is four. 2n is 4, 2n is 4. Meiosis is reducing the chromosome number. 2n is 4. Ooh, n, that's 2 at the end of meiosis 1. And n, that's only two chromosomes at the end of meiosis 2. Some of the uh, new events of uh, uh, meiosis that are involved in increasing genetic variation, it occurs in prophase one. In prophase one, you get synapsis, the pairing of the homologous chromosomes, chiasmata, the laying over of non-sister chromatids, they lay over each other and form crossovers, and then crossing over is where those pieces that are laid over forming chiasma, they're crossed over to the non-sister chromatids. Now, independent assortment of homologous chromosomes means that how they line up is random. When the homologs pair up in the cell, it's totally random. Uh, it does, it's not all female chromosomes that came from mom are on the left and all dads are on the right. It's just however they line up. It's going to be a combination of the mom's homolog on the left and the dad's on the right, the dad's on the left, the mom's on the, on the right, just a mixture. And I'll show that on the next slide. Random fertilization. <clears throat> this implies that uh, uh, you don't really know who you're going to be making babies with, and so it's a random event for fertilization, and that keeps the DNA mixed up in the environment, the population. It gives a genetic variation to the population. This is showing that independent assortment. <clears throat> this could happen where all of the chromosomes that dad gave uh, to you in, in meiosis, you know, for meiosis line up on the left, and all the ones that mom gave you, hers were all lined up on the right. That could happen. But it's not going to be that way, most likely. It's going to be variety. Here's an example that I usually give in my classes. If I got some pennies, and they were uh, 10 years, 2000 to 2009, and I got uh, 10 of them from the Philadelphia Mint, which does not have a letter on it. It just has 2000, 2001, all the way to 2009. And then I got another 10 pennies that had, they came from the Denver Mint, so they do have a letter on there. It'd be 2000 
with a D underneath it all the way to 2009 with a D under that, that date also. Well, if I got the 2000, the plane and the Philadelphia, and I shook them in my hand, I put them on, you know, didn't look, put them on the table, got the 2001, shook them, put them on the table, all the way to 2009, do you think that they would all be Philadelphia on the left and Denver on the right? That's independent assortment. It's just a random event. It's a random event. And you can see that by having this random event, um, you see that you have four outcomes of gametes over here. We look at the left one where you didn't really have any independent assortment, and you've got two different types of gametes. Half are all male and half are all female. Whereas with this independent assortment and, of course, the crossing over stuff, you end up with four different combinations of gametes here. Here is a uh, short segment showing spermatogenesis, the formation of sperm by meiosis. And you see here's a diploid cell has four chromosomes in it. In meiosis one, you end up with two daughter cells that have two. And meiosis two is just gonna copy that and produce clones of each cell. So each of the daughter cells of each of these cells have two chromosomes. And those are what become the sperm, they're haploid sperm. So meiosis one reduces the chromosome number. And you can see the reduction of the cells here are the result. And meiosis two just copies. This, this cell had two chromosomes, well, so do the daughter cells. This one had two, so do the daughter cells. And so the sperm have two. When you look at the female, her oogonial cell had four chromosomes. Meiosis one is gonna reduce the chromosome number. And here you have the production from meiosis one of two haploid cells. These cells undergo uh, meiosis two, and you see that these were two, and so are the gametes. This has two, and so are its gametes. What you can tell here is that three of these are called polar bodies. They're very, very small, but they're still haploid. And one is very large. This is the ovum that's ovulated. 